Hey everyone, welcome to another short lecture. So this week we're going to talk about uh, John Fisk and uh, the two articles that we looked at for this week, Activated Texts and Active Audiences. So before we get started, I should note that there is also a reading that I put on there at the beginning of the semester from Janice Radway uh, called Reading the Romance. So I'm going to go ahead and make that reading optional because after going through the, the, the Fisk readings, I realized that I gave you a fair amount. And so I don't want to totally inundate you, so you do not have to read Radway for this week. And uh, I'll, I'll let you know that now. Uh, and also uh, let you know if you do want to read Radway and turn in a uh, abstract, if you need a, another abstract to, to hit your uh, number, to hit your 10, you're welcome to, to do that as well. So again, it's up to you, um, but I do ask that you read the two Fisk articles, Activated Texts and Active Audiences. So with that, let's go ahead and, and get started. So at the beginning of these, I, I, I usually like to ask the question, what is, uh, what is the author doing? What are, what are they trying to do? And so what Fisk is doing here in his discussion of active audiences is that he's challenging the idea that audiences are, are passive consumers of media. Uh, you know, an example of the passive consumer would be the couch potato, right? The so-called couch potato, the person who, who, who just sits on the couch and, and watches TV and it just kind of washes over them. And they're, they're not at all active is the idea, right? They're, they're a potato, they're a vegetable. They're, they're sitting there watching uh, TV programs and not doing anything, right? And so fundamentally, what Fisk is doing is he's challenging this idea that, that uh, viewers, audience members, uh, aren't doing anything when they watch TV. Uh, and he's, he's mostly talking about TV here, but it applies to things like reading books or, or watching movies too, right? Um, and, and what he says is going on is that what, what the audience member, what the viewer is really doing it, it, when they sit there and they watch a TV show is they're making meanings out of the, the messages uh, that they're watching, right? The messages that are being sent to them uh, in the form of TV programs. They're, they're figuring out the plot. They're, they're, they're following the plot. They're, they're learning about the characters. They're, they're figuring out what the, what the text means, right? And, and so mentally, we can argue that, that these uh, consumers really are active. And, and that's what Fisk, that's the bottom line about what he's getting at here. So with this in mind, he, he begins, and, and he uses some fancy language, but what he's really doing is he's, he's distinguishing between audience members as what he calls textual subjects and social subjects. Now for a long time, uh, and, and this is very true in film theory, for example, uh, scholars tend to think of audiences or have thought of audiences or in audience members as what we call textual subjects. And these textual subjects are really kind of powerless and inactive. So uh, this is that more traditional idea of, of the audience, and it's one that we have seen a lot in, in, in our readings this semester. So for example, Adorno and Horkheimer would regard the audience as uh, textual subjects, meaning that they're passive, that they're being fed messages, ideological messages when it comes to Adorno and Horkheimer, right? They're being fed these messages and, and, and they're consuming them without question, right? They're, they're just taking in this capitalist ideology, for example, with Adorno and Horkheimer. However, right, since the emergence of the Birmingham School, Right? And, and, and British Cultural Studies, right? the BCCCS, uh, we've started thinking about audience members as social subjects rather than textual subjects. And when we talk about them as social subjects, put real simply, we're talking about real people with social histories. So, so people who, who have lived personal experience, real people who are consuming these shows. Okay? So, Fisk talks a lot, he gives us kind of a history of, of how this active audience idea comes about, and, and a lot of it has to do with uh, scholars like Morley, who he, he cites throughout, 
right? And and Morley worked for the, for the Birmingham School, right? The the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, uh, and and. What Morley did as a professor was that he conducted audience reception studies. He did ethnographies where he went out and spoke to real people who watched real TV programs to find out what they thought about these things, what they thought about the programs that they were watching. And, and so scholars like Morley, the folks at, you know in the Birmingham Center, uh, and, and since then, a whole bunch of people, including myself, have recognized that real people uh, that make up audiences have different backgrounds, and as a result, they read or view texts differently, right? So, so ultimately, what, what Morley is saying, and, and what in turn Fisk is saying, is that when you study real people watching real programs, you begin to realize that, that these people all have different social histories, different life histories, different life experiences. And so as a result, when they watch TV programs, they decode them differently, right? So this is, you can remember here, Stuart Hall's three different forms of reading, right? The dominant, negotiated, and resistant readings, right? So Hall said there were three different ways we could look at a text. And, and what Morley is saying is that, uh, the ways that we look at these texts have a lot to do with our with our personal histories, where we grew up, uh, how we identify, right, uh, where we went to school, how much money our parents had, how much education we have, right. All these things feed into the ways that you interpret the messages that are coming across in different kinds of media texts. So then, we could think of the, this fancy term of social subjects as real audiences, real people. And each member of the audience has a different background. And, and, and this is what Fisk is, is, means when he's writing about social subjectivity. Social subjectivity is just a fancy way of saying that, that these real people all have different lives that they've led, right? They, they were raised in different circumstances, and experience different things, and so as a result, it's it's all that information, all those experiences, then influence how they make sense out of TV programs or movies or books, right? And so different people make different kinds of meanings out of the films they see, the TV shows they watch, and the books that they read. So, for example, as a 49-year-old white male college professor from Pennsylvania. I might go watch uh, the new Black Adam movie and, and, and understand it differently than uh, a 12-year-old African-American girl attending elementary school and living in Los Angeles, right? Because we're coming from two different places, right? We're, we're, we've, we've led two different lives. We've had two different experiences. We, we, we think of ourselves and our communities in different ways. And so when we go watch the same movie we might interpret it differently. And I gotta tell you, so this is a really kind of an exciting idea for me because I've always felt this way. And then when I finally got to school and I read Fisk and I read about active audiences, I said, yeah, that's absolutely right. I can remember, for example, my seventh grade English teacher, we were reading some horrible book like uh, Johnny Tremaine or The Red Badge of Courage or something like that. And uh, she, I remember she asked the class, like, what does this passage in, in, in the book mean? And I raised my hand and I answered the question. And, and she looked at me and she said, no, Eric, you're wrong. And I thought to myself, how can I be wrong? <laughs> right? Like, that's what I got out of it. That's how, that's, that's how I interpreted it. That's what I thought it meant. So how can I be wrong? Who says her way is the right way? And, you know, in a sense, that's what Fisk and Morley and, and all these other people are saying. They're saying, you know, how you interpret it, how you make sense of it is, is perfectly valid and, and just as right as somebody who's different than you, right? We all take different meanings from these texts is the point. So again, one of the key points here is that audiences are rarely, if ever, passive, right? That this is what he means by active audiences. So when we're watching a movie, reading a book, or watching TV, we're active, in quotes, because we're making sense, we're making meaning out of what we're seeing or reading. 
And the way we make sense out of these things depends on our individual life experiences, how we've lived, what we've learned, etc., etc. I know, I, if, if you think that I'm repeating the same thing several different ways, I am. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and the reason I'm doing that is because I, I want to drive home this key idea. I, I want you to understand that this is really the, the, the overarching main point of, of both these readings, in a sense. The idea, number one, that audiences don't just sit there and, and get spoon-fed, you know, TV shows and movies and so on. They watch them. And as they watch them, they make sense out of them. They make meaning. And that is an active process, right? You, you know, I, I think um, some of you may do this too, but I read a lot at night when I want to go to sleep. I lay in bed and, and, and read a book, and pretty soon I'm tired, I'm sleepy, and I want to go to sleep. Now, why does reading make you tired? <laughs> you know, have you ever wondered that? Well, the answer is that reading is hard work. That making meaning, making sense out of reading, particularly if it's some of the stuff we read for this class, right? It's hard. It's hard to do. And it wears you out. It makes you tired. It is not a passive activity. Right? It, it's, it's, it's not a passive act. It's an active act. Right? All right. So then, uh, we've talked about a little bit about David Morley already. So David Morley of the Birmingham School. The reason that Fisk talks about him so much is that he's one of the first scholars to examine how real people made sense out of the real TV shows that they watch based on their personal experience, based on their social subjectivity. And Morley used ethnography as a way to examine these audience members. Now, ethnography, which I'm assuming many of you know what this is, but in case you don't, ethnography is when you take your, yourself as a scholar, as a researcher, and, and put yourself in with the people that, that, that you're examining, right? You become part of, of that culture, and you go and you talk to them to find out what they know, right? Now, for Morley because he was the first guy, you know, he was just taking the first steps, a lot of his study was based in, in an examination as of text and reception as it's related to social class and occupations, right? So, so he wanted to see, he was British, and of course in British culture, uh, class plays a much bigger role, right? So there's a very well-defined upper class and aristocracy and a very well-defined working class, right? And so he wanted to, because he was British, he wanted to look at uh, how these different classes made sense out of the TV programs that they were watching. And, and he based a lot of it in, in class. Now, since then, we, we've, we've taken a lot of other factors into account, right? There's all kinds of audience reception studies uh, that, that um, consider things other than just social class, right? They consider things like gender and race and, and, and so on. So, Morley found, when he did his studies of the British people, he found that reading the television text is ultimately a process of negotiation. So it's a process of negotiation between uh, the existing subject position, right? So, so the experience of the person watching the, the TV show, and the one proposed by the text itself, so the message that the text is sending. And he says, in this negotiation, the balance of power lies with the reader. So the text is trying to send you a message, right? Maybe it's an ideological message, like Adorno and Horkheimer maintained. Maybe it's an ideological message that favors capitalism. <coughs> and so Morley says, okay, that's cool that the text has this message, but it's, it's the, the reader's not receiving this message without a negotiation. And indeed, the negotiation is between what they know, what they've lived, what they've experienced, and the message, right, in the message, right, the, the ideology that's, that's embedded in the message. And, and ultimately, it's the reader's history and, and their subjectivity right, that, that has more power in this negotiation. And so he says, 
the meanings found in the text shift towards the subject position of the reader more than the reader's subjectivity is subjected to the ideological power of the text. So an example of this, maybe you are a, a Democrat and you're watching a, a campaign ad for Donald Trump and you see this and, and the Donald Trump ad is loaded with, with ideology, right? Conservative political ideology. And, and you watch this, you're, you're not going to just watch it and say, oh yeah, he's right. You're going to watch it with, with your entire history, right? Your beliefs, your education, all that behind you. And you're going to watch it. And ultimately, it's going to be your personal experience and your subjectivity that has more power in that equation than the political message of the ad. Right? So that's, that's sort of what he's trying to get at. Now, with TV, right, when we talk about TV programs, we, the people who make these programs want them to be popular, right? That's, that's sort of the whole idea behind making a TV program is that it's popular so that you can sell advertising. At least that's the way TV used to work, right? So Fisk says to be popular, the TV text, the TV program, has to uh, be read and enjoyed by a diversity of social groups so its meanings must be capable of being inflected in a number of different ways. So what he's saying here is that to be popular, a TV text has to be open to different interpretations. It's, it's got to be presented in a way so that people of all different backgrounds can look at it and, and get something out of it that they enjoy, something that's pleasurable. And so he comes to the conclusion, he tells us the television text is therefore more polysemic. So poly, uh, polysemic means it speaks in, in multiple voices. That's literally the Latin meaning of the term polysemic, speaking in multiple voices. So he's saying the television text is therefore more polysemic and more open than earlier theorists allowed for. So what he's saying is Adorno and Horkheimer and all these guys, you know, they might... Well, they weren't talking about TV, but if they were, they might watch a TV program and say, this is just capitalist ideology being shoved down people's throats, right? And, and so Fisk would say, no, nah, man, it's, it's not that simple, right? This TV show speaks to people in different ways. It's not just capitalist ideology. It's popular, and it can only be popular if it speaks to people of all different backgrounds. And to speak to people of all different backgrounds, it's got to be open to interpretation. It's got to be it's got to be something that's open to interpretation in such a way so that all different kinds of people can find it fun or interesting, right? So that they can get some kind of meaning out of it that means something to them. So oh, here we go. Sorry, if we, I probably should have gone a slide forward a second ago. But polysemic means that it speaks with many voices. And so here he begins talking about Umberto Eco's, who's another scholar, uh, Umberto Eco's idea of open and closed texts. So Eco says that an open text is one that speaks with many voices. It's open to a variety of interpretation. A closed text, on the other hand, is the opposite. It's a text that, that, that makes it hard to interpret it in different ways. It's purposefully closed down by its authors. So to give you some examples, uh, an open text would be uh, something like a classic novel, right? That, that still appeals to people, right? So something like uh, uh, Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, or the Bible. I mean, the Bible might be one of the most open texts that there is, right? Uh, it's, it's been interpreted by all different kinds of Christians in all kinds of different ways for 2,000 years. Some take it literally, some take it as allegory, right? They, they interpret it in all different kinds of ways. So it's an open text. It's open to all different kinds of interpretation. An example of a closed text would be something like a car commercial, right? A car commercial only is meant to the owners or the creators only want you to, to read it in one way, which is go buy a car, right? So ads, the, the creators of ads try to create closed texts, ones that aren't open to interpretation, in the same way that people who are making popular works, popular fiction, for example, 
movies, TV shows, they're trying to create open text that appeal to all different kinds of people and can be read in different ways. So again, meaning making, making sense out of a TV show or a book or a movie, is a kind of negotiation for Fisk. He says it's a negotiation between the viewer and the text, right? The text always has some kind of dominant or preferred reading, right? But the viewer has their own ideas, right? And so the meaning that's made comes out of the negotiation between these two, right? So if you look at, uh, you know, there are interesting cases of this when you begin to think about it more deeply. So for example, the movie The Room is, uh, was created in such a way that it was meant to be taken seriously as a drama, right? And so it had this preferred reading. The preferred reading was to take it as a serious drama. But then a bunch of people watched it, and they thought it was kind of funny. It was so bad, it was funny. And, and so they interpreted it differently. And so that meaning at the end, the meaning that's made that where the room becomes sort of a cult film that people go to watch because it's so bad it's good, that meaning is the resu result of a negotiation between... The, the movie, the text on one hand, and, and the people watching it on the other, right? And ultimately, this meaning that they make, again, derives from the intersection of, of the viewer's social history and those social forces that are built into the text, the meanings that are, that are encoded in the text. And somewhere in this intersection of the viewer and the text, right, we get meaning. And meaning-making is just fancy communication talk for making sense out of something, for making sense out of a text. Okay. From there, in, in the second piece, Fisk talks about what he calls activated texts. And here, what he's talking about is, he's, he's t specifically, he's trying to figure out, you know, what are some of the things, some of the devices, he calls them, uh, that that open up the TV text, right? What uh, he says the TV text has to be an open text, so that it can be popular. And and so he goes through and and he says, you know, what 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 devices work in this context to make it more open, right? Specifically, in in Fist fancy language, he says uh, these devices work against ideological closure and make the text accessible to and popular with a variety of audiences. And so he talks about uh, a variety of things, and you don't need to know all these, but he talks about irony and jokes and, and so on, and he talks about how all these different things that, that we see in TV shows can be interpreted in different ways. And each one of these is a device that helps open up the text. Now, it's not important that you know each one. It's just important for you to know that Fisk sees the TV text as particularly open, right? As, as something that's that's really open to interpretation. And again, here he goes further into Umberto Eco's work on open and closed texts. So Eco calls texts that do not attempt to close off alternative meanings and narrow their focus to one meaning open. Now, interestingly, I've told you this before, but interestingly here now, Echo suggests that open texts are usually highbrow, while closed texts are lowbrow. So what he's saying here is that open texts are generally considered high art, right? whereas closed texts are usually more lowbrow, more for the, for the peasants, right? And so he says, what's weird about TV, though, is that TV texts are open, but they're not highbrow entertainment, right? TV, TV has never, ever been considered highbrow entertainment until about the last 10 or 15 years with shows like The Sopranos and The Wire, Breaking Bad, all these uh, new programs that are, that are really, I mean, it's even hard to call them TV in a way because they're cable and they're not network TV, and, and um, they're arguably they're much more artistic in their bent, right? So when he's talking about TV, he's talking about 
uh, broadcast TV and uh, the good old days of things like Green Acres and Gilligan's Island and Hogan's Heroes and, uh, you know, uh, Cheers, right? All the, all the shows that your parents used to watch, probably, right? So he says, TV techs are open, but they're not highbrow. Instead, he makes a new word for what they are, and he calls them producery. I'm sorry, producerly. I, I have a hell of a time with some of these words. And he says, producerly texts are open like highbrow texts, so they're open to interpretation, but instead of being fancy, like an art house film or something like that, right? They speak to readers slash viewers in a language that they understand. Right? So TV speaks to all of us in a way that, that anyone can understand. And, and they really count then on the reader or the viewer to interpret the programs in their own way. And this is the producerly text. The producerly text is not just open, but it's open and it counts on the, on the viewer or the reader to interpret it in their own way. Now, this is as far as I go with this lecture. There's a lot more in the readings, and I, you know, I, I do expect you to read them. But what I wanted to do here, because there was so much, is that I wanted to cover the key points and make sure that you understood these. Because this is, you know, there's only so much, let's be honest, right? There's only so much that you're going to take from any college course that you're going to carry with you and remember. What I went over today are the points that I feel are really important about these readings are the kind of things that I want you to remember and that I think will be most useful to you as you live your life. You don't have to go to grad school, right? But, but knowing this stuff would help you if you did go to grad school. But even more to the point, knowing this stuff might help you think about TV as you're watching it in your daily life in a new way. And begin to consider, as you're watching a TV program or you're watching Netflix, how is this text open to interpretation? How might different people from different walks of life get something meaningful out of it? And of course, many of you want to make TV and film. And so, as filmmakers, one of the things that Fisk would tell you to think about is how can you make your text speak to a whole bunch of people and, and in a way that's open to interpretation so that all different kinds of people could, could find something valuable in it. And that's ultimately what this is about. All right, that's it for this lecture. Thanks for checking it out, and I hope you learned something.